What's going on, everybody? This is Jake Fabian at 16 Fabian Jacob. You can follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, RIP. Um, this is Vibe Space Drafting, and this is our inaugural episode of the show. So uh, we're going to be reviewing Daniel Jeremiah's Mock Draft 1.0 today. Um, obviously, I'm a fantasy football guy. I am not an offensive line guy. I am not a defense guy. So we're going to be just hitting the highlights here. 11 prospects selected in this one round, first round only mock draft by Daniel Jeremiah. For those who don't know, Daniel Jeremiah is a league insider. He is also a scout for NFL.com. But his main motivation in presenting a mock draft is that he is putting together who he thinks, based on the conversations he's had, will be drafted by particular teams. When we see Daniel Jeremiah put out a mock draft, we should listen because he's plugged into the conversations these front offices are having. So his mock draft is not necessarily a, a ranking of prospects or anything like that. So just to add that context before we dive in here. First overall, Caleb Williams. Chicago Bears. Now, this is the chalk pick here at the first overall pick. We are expecting Caleb Williams to go first overall to the Bears, or at least I am at this time. There are some people who believe they should hang on to Justin Fields, which I think would be a mistake just in terms of the contract clock for building a roster around a rookie quarterback. The roster is coming along. We saw substantial improvements for the Chicago Bears team in 2023. But it could be even better if we just reset the clock here with a superior prospect in Caleb Williams. And Justin Fields, he's he's not really shown. There has, has been growth, right? They, they let him throw the ball a little bit more. His completion percentage has risen. His passer rating has risen. His sack percentage has fallen. But those numbers are still egregious, right? We're still hovering at around 61% completion percentage. 10% of his dropbacks are resulting in sacks. And sure, you can say the, the offensive line is is partly at fault there, but Justin Fult, Justin Fields is also taking sharing some of that blame in his time to throw, in his sort of pocket movement movement skills not improving. Yeah, I, I totally agree with this pick for Caleb Williams to the Bears first overall. And with that kind of draft capital and that landing spot with DJ Moore and Cole Komet, this, this is a decent spot for Caleb Williams to get started and start showing his stuff in a Shane Waldron offense that has proven to be pretty pass-happy despite Pete Carroll's bef best efforts. Next, we have Drake May, second overall to the Washington Commanders. Now, Sam Howell's a fun guy, but he's, he's much closer to the mushroom kind of fun guy than the actual NFL quarterback kind of fun guy. He's, he's very fun to watch. He's entertaining. He likes to air the ball out, but he makes mistakes. And similar to Justin Fields, he holds the ball too long in the pocket. He misses those open reads. And Drake May is going to be brought in to fix a lot of that. This is a pretty chalky pick as well. A lot of people, you'll see people on X saying, oh, Drake May is over Caleb Williams for me. Or, oh, Caleb Williams paints his nails, so it's got to be Drake May for me. Or all of these things. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm also of the opinion that if Caleb Williams is going first overall to Chicago and Drake May is going second overall to Washington in potentially a, another year of a pass-happy Eric Bieniemy offense with Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel, maybe they address tight end in the draft this year or in free agency. There are a couple of interesting options like Noah Fant or Mike Gesicki. Yeah, I, I, I'm a Mike Gesicki guy. Sorry, guys. Um that's, that's, that's an old wound. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, there's a lot of weapons here for Drake May. And while I don't believe he's the same caliber prospect as Caleb Williams, I do think that the gap between them is not so wide as a lot of people will be asking to trade down from 101 to 102 or 103 in your dynasty rookie drafts. So definitely love this fit here for Drake May in Washington. Next up is Jaden Daniels, third overall to New England. And Mac Jones, RIP, Bailey Zappi. I'm not sure we can even say RIP because was he ever living to, to rest in the first place? But that aside, this is a very interesting pick. And I love Jaden Daniels. He's one of my favorite prospects in this draft. So this is very exciting for me to see a guy like DJ 
plug him in at third overall, that means these conversations are happening in NFL front offices that despite being a fifth year super senior with only that one really good year on his resume, boy, was that a good year. We're talking like a Joe Burrow level emergence. Now, of course, LSU wasn't quite in that national championship discussion to vault Jaden Daniels in quite the same way that Joe Burrow was his year. But nonetheless, we're talking a dual threat quarterback, over a thousand yards rushing, um, one of the highest rushing dominators we've seen since Cam Newton. And that's just statistically speaking, not a, not a stylistic comp. That's, that's not, I'm not saying Jaden Daniels is Cam Newton, but could he be a Robert Griffin the third as a rusher? There's, there's a lot of upside here with Jaden Daniels as a prospect. There are some concerns I've seen from the film community as far as getting through his reads and maybe it certainly doesn't hurt to have two first round wide receiver prospects in Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. But Joe Burrow had Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. So, I mean, sometimes good players play together and we just have to accept it. But Jaden Daniels, if he gets this kind of draft capital, I probably will be taking him at 103, even in my dynasty rookie drafts, he'll be right up there in the conversation with Drake May. For me, I'll, I'll probably have Jaden Daniels ahead of Drake May, to be honest, just because of the, the rushing floor. Now we don't know what New England's offensive coordinator situation will be with new head coach Gerard Mayo. So that's that's a little TBD there. But at least at the time of this recording, we don't know. But so that could influence my decision. I doubt it will. But if Jaden Daniels gets top five draft capital, we are all in. Next, we have Marvin Harrison Jr. Again, D- Daniel Jeremiah just like doing the fantasy community a solid here with this start. Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, and now Marvin Harrison Jr. All fantasy relevant picks in the top four. And Marvin Harrison Jr. goes to the Arizona Cardinals. Now, Kyler Murray, we've seen what he can do with DeAndre Hopkins in the past. And I'm not saying that Marvin Harrison Jr. is a shoe in to be a DeAndre Hopkins level player. Of course, he's much more athletically gifted than DeHop ever was. There's definitely a ceiling for Marvin Harrison Jr. where he is in the conversation with Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase next year. So Kyler is a great quarterback to deliver the ball. He's he's given us fantasy wide receiver one stretches of production from guys like uh, Marquise Brown. And we, we see... Trey McBride thriving as the number one option there right now. But in my opinion, this is a pick that rising tides lift all ships. You'll see people doubting Trey McBride after this pick. You'll see people saying, oh, he can't be a, a top five t- dynasty tight end or, or a top five redraft tight end even because he's now capped because Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to show up and be the alpha on day one. My take on that is that Trey McBride posted a 30% a near 30% target share while Zach Ertz was out last year. And he had run, run of the roost. Yeah, there were wide receiver injuries involved in that, that um, he was really the only main option. But we've seen in the past um, offenses that run through two main options in a consolidated target tree. Take, for example, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews and Marquise Brown. I mean, these, these, two-headed monsters, De- Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown also come to mind, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. So we've seen these offenses consolidate around two really good players, and I think that's very likely to happen here in Arizona. So I, if, if these quarterbacks get go one, two, three in the actual NFL draft, I may consider dropping Marvin Harrison Jr. down to 103, 104 in my Superflex ranks just because that – Access to an elite quarterback is potentially a game-breaking advantage in Dynasty Superflex, but Marvin Harrison Jr., just such an elite wide receiver prospect. I I don't know. It's it's something I'll have to think about, and I'm thinking about in real time as I speak, but it'd be hard to move Marvin Harrison Jr. out of that 102 spot, and, and that may just be take lock for now, but especially with this landing spot, it's, it's just such a good spot. Um, Next, we have uh, Rome Odunze going to the Chargers at fifth overall. This is interesting because we recently found out that Jim Harbaugh will be the head coach of the Chargers. Kellen Moore has been let go, and he signed with the Eagles to be their offensive coordinator. So we're really seeing a, a cleaning of house here in Los Angeles. But we get Odunze paired up with Justin Herbert. Um, we have Mike Williams returning from an ACL injury. We have Keenan Allen just aging and 
breaking down before our eyes, which is unfortunate, but that's just how it goes. That's that's the aging curve of an NFL wide receiver. Definitely makes sense after the disappointing year we got from Quentin Johnston for the Chargers to double down with another wide receiver. I do have concerns about Odunze as a prospect. I don't think he's quite on the same level as uh, Marvin Harrison or a Malik Neighbors in this class. Uh, I have half a mind to put him down at wide receiver four behind another wide receiver that we'll see in DJ's first round here. But if he gets this kind of draft capital in this landing spot, I think I might have to just keep him at one wide receiver three because Jim Harbaugh, everywhere he's gone, he's seen success. And whatever that success looks like philosophically for this offense, his only NFL tenure was very run heavy, but that was with Greg Roman as offensive coordinator. And that was with Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick as his quarterbacks. So it's very different right now, right? With uh, Justin Herbert and depleted defensive side of the ball for the Chargers, we could see a new side of Jim Harbaugh, even with a first round, at least rumored to be first round uh, talent at quarterback at Michigan this past year, we saw a very run heavy defense centric approach. So it'll be interesting to see how Harbaugh adapts to the situation in Los Angeles and to watch their offseason moves. But Roma Dunze, fifth overall to the Chargers, can't complain at all. And I definitely still have a Dunze probably as my 107 with this landing spot. Caleb, May, Daniels, Marvin, Neighbors. Yeah, Brock, and then Odunze. Yeah, so next we have Malik Neighbors. Now this this would be a pretty disappointing spot, I think, for Neighbors, in my opinion, to the Giants at sixth. So we're seeing a first round where we're supposing probably Daniel Jones is back at quarterback for the Giants coming off a torn ACL. I'd like to see this team address offensive line in the draft, personally. They're 32nd ranked pass blocking unit per PFF. It was pretty atrocious. It was, it was a little fun to see Tommy Cutlets running around back there, but boy, was he running a lot of the time because this, this offensive line needs work. But hopefully Brian Dable's offense can get some use. I'm, I'm struggling here, guys. This, this would make me so sad for Malik Neighbors. The only reason I'd still be taking him in the 105 to 106 range of, of rookie drafts would be be because I just believe so strongly in the talent. Um, but this would definitely be close to the nut low landing spot for neighbors. Next, we have Bo Nix going in the first round. So this is the first spicy one for me, mainly both because he's going in the first round as a super senior, and he's also going to the New Orleans Saints. So the Saints purportedly don't believe that uh, Derek Carr is going to be the option moving forward. Maybe there's a trial run this year. Maybe they take a Mahomes type of approach and, and sit Knicks for 2024 and uh, roll him out with a year of, of experience, learning and growing. But to me, this is a pretty rough pick. Knicks has the lowest big time throw rate among the major prospects in this class. I'm not sure of the impact here for Chris Olave. This is definitely a, a roster that is in salary cap. I wouldn't say salary cap hell, but uh, it's definitely salary cap scramble mode every year, it seems. So it may be time to get on a, on that rookie contract sort of cycle. But then we still have Derek Carr on the books and we need to do something about that. So I don't know. It's an interesting spot for Bo Nix. I probably... I'm not sure if he would crack the first round. On draft capital alone, he probably has to. But... Yeah, he'd, he'd definitely be in that 110 to 112 range of dynasty rookie drafts for me. Brock Bowers goes 15th overall with the very next pick to Indianapolis. I am not sure how I feel about this pick, really, because Indianapolis, we've seen them adopt this tight end by committee approach that I think Bowers would immediately blow up on day one. Bowers hopefully would consolidate all those routes, but we don't know for sure how Shane Steichen would deploy them, especially due to Anthony Richardson's growth and development, how, how we saw a lot in, in a very limited sample, granted, but a lot of the, the RPO and the run heavy type of stuff that we saw the Colts do when Anthony Richardson was still in the game. It's obviously very encouraging that when Gardner Minshew came in, the offense looked functional and that's really all you could ask for with a backup quarterback in the game. And the Colts were competitive down the stretch, but 
uh, Brock Bowers is an insanely gifted tight end prospect. This is one of the lower landing spots that I think I've seen in some of the early mocks so far. People are throwing out Kyle Pitts comparisons. People are throwing out Rob Gronkowski comparisons. I get the hype for Brock Bowers, and I'd definitely still be taking him around 106 in in my rookie drafts, um, especially in tight end premium. But yeah, it's I don't I don't know. This is one of the landing spots that makes me less certain about Brock Bowers' future. So next we have Brian Thomas Jr going 21st overall to Miami. Now, the Dolphins have they they were one of the teams I referenced earlier that's consolidated between two main options, right? We have Tyreek Hill, we have J- Jalen Waddle, and now we're we're starting to see the emergence of Devon Achan, right? And so this team their identity has been this sort of run heavy. They actually use a fullback at the highest rate in the NFL. So the, the, the Dolphins have this play action identity out of 22 personnel that to me doesn't leave a lot of room for Brian Thomas Jr. to step in day one. So this one is an interesting fit for me. I'm not a huge fan of Brian Thomas Jr.'s game so far, just based on my initial impressions. But yeah, Brian Thomas Jr. would seem to be the odd man out for me in Miami. Then we have Devontez Walker from North Carolina going to the chiefs at 29th overall Devontae Walker is a deep threat. He is a vertical stretcher and that's, that's about as far as the extent of nice things I can really say about him. I, I, I'm not like out on him. I just don't know enough of his game. He's one of those more down the board prospects for me that I definitely should look more into after seeing DJ put him, up this high. We obviously want to see Patrick Mahomes getting more weapons, but Devontae Walker, I'm not sure if he's the kind of weapon that we want. So yeah, that's, that's all I got there really. Troy Franklin, this is the guy I was referring to when I was foreshadowing, maybe having somebody over Roma Dunze. I really love Troy Franklin broke out at a young age at Oregon has been insanely productive. He's a burner with a big body. It'll be interesting to see where he comes in at the combine weight-wise because he's listed at 185. But if he goes 32nd overall to uh, the Ravens, I'll definitely be taking him as my wide receiver for 108 in my Dynasty Rookie uh, Superflex drafts. Just a quick recap with some winners and losers here. Caleb Williams went first overall to Chicago. Drake May second overall to Washington. Jaden Daniels, third overall to New England. Marvin Harrison Jr., fourth overall to Arizona. Roma Dunze, fifth overall to Los Angeles Chargers. Malik Neighbors, sixth overall to the Giants. Bo Nix, 14th overall to the Saints. Brock Bowers, 15th to the Colts. Brian Thomas Jr., 21st overall to the Dolphins. And Devontae Walker, 29th overall to the Chiefs. Troy Frank- Troy Franklin, pick 32 to the Ravens. So winners and losers, obviously Terry McLaurin, DJ Moore, Cole Komet, big winners at the top end of this draft, as well as Kyler Murray, especially if they bring back Marquise Brown, the more weapons, the merrier there. And Justin Herbert maybe is a winner here where I'm not the biggest fan of Rome as a prospect, but obviously I I still very early in the process, a little concerned about the coaching philosophy that might be applied there to Justin Herbert. So He's, he's a maybe winner for, for me for now. Losers would be Derek Carr. Um, we, we don't know what his future holds. If we're seeing insiders suggesting that the Saints would go quarterback in the first round, so that's a major red flag. And Justin Fields is the biggest loser here, I think. The, the assumption right now for me would be that Justin Fields is going to start somewhere in 2024, but where? And for how long are the biggest question marks to me? Because when we see quarterbacks get traded away in the third year, after the third year of their NFL career, third or fourth year, just to name some examples, we saw Sam Darnold traded after his third year in the league. We saw Bears fans will know Kyle Orton as a throwback traded after the third year of his career. Drew Locke, Jimmy Garoppolo traded after the third year of their career. Sam Bradford, traded after the fourth year of his career. Baker Mayfield traded after the fourth year of his career. Teams don't usually hang on to, or 
teams who give up on their young quarterbacks on a rookie contract or on an expiring contract, there's usually good reason, right? We don't see a lot of success stories in the NFL who take this career path or who have this career path foisted upon them by their teams. Those are my thoughts on Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft 1.0. Just some quick information about the show here. So this is this is my first time doing my own show. So vibes based drafting is going to be mock drafts, mock draft reviews like this one, as well as throughout the summer, we're going to be streaming underdog best ball. And we're just hoping to spread some good vibes. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know where you agree, where you disagree with my analysis. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Tell me why I'm uh, why I shouldn't be worried at all about Brock Bowers, or tell me why Devontae Walker deserves to go in the first round. Not not trying to hate on him, just saying I didn't didn't cross my radar as as a first round pick. Tell me what you're seeing that I'm missing. And this has been another episode of Vibes Base Drafting. Peace. <laughs>